So hello, hello everyone, my name is Martin, not Marjan. <laughs> um, people call me Juj as well, so that's my nickname. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about Domain's journey from, from SAS to CSS and JS. Um, someone told me to start off with a joke, so I figured why not. Why did the programmer quit his job? Why? Because he didn't get the raise. <laughs> So a quick, uh, quick introduction to myself. So I currently work at Domain, Domain Group as a principal engineer. I've been here for about three years. Um, I, I love things all Nintendo, um, especially the Zelda series. I love basketball, so I've been watching the playoffs recently, getting pretty engrossed in that. Uh, there's my son, who, who of course I love. I also love my, my lawn. Um, which a lot of people think is a bit of a strange passion, but um, yeah, that's what I like. So. I'm also on Twitter. Um, I don't really post that much. Um, what I do post is usually just text stuff. I, I try and stay away from political stuff. So, so a bit about the domain um, front end landscape, um, which maybe some people are already familiar with. Maybe Justice already talked about it previously, but. I'll just go through it again. Um, we have many reusable React components which are themable, um, around about 288. They all reside in different GitHub re repositories, um, which is a lot. So we're, we're actually in the process of trying to amalgamate some of those and group them together in maybe the mono repos. Um, we also have many page level components, uh, so page level React components around about 62. Uh, we have four single page applications at the moment. And we have many node servers, which, which are used to server-side render React. So here's a very uh, high level overview with a <coughs> uh, really fancy diagram here. But um, as you can see, there's uh, reusable components there. So each of those FE codes will be a separate re repository at the moment. Um, and then a page component or a spa component would um, import, I guess, some of those some of those reusable components. And then you've got a, a node server which renders either that spa or, or page component. So yeah, I'd like to discuss the main group's journey it has made to CSS and JS. It was a long journey. It's uh, spanned probably more than two years. Um, and yeah, um, what I'm talking about is our work to move, move away from it. Um, and it, it's, it's been on and off work. It hasn't been like, you know, we've been engrossed in this for two years, but um, it's been on and off work. Whenever people, people have got time to work on this, um, outside of normal product work, they've jumped onto, onto it. Um, hopefully this is going to be interesting. Um, maybe you'll learn a few things, maybe you won't, but yeah, hopefully it's going to be interesting. So yeah, I started back in uh, 2016. Uh, when I when I first started, there was a handful of React components uh, which already used SAS. There, were, there was already a common uh, style library, uh, which which we called FEBrary. I believe, I'm not sure why. Uh, Front end library, right? Um, which was already written in SAS. So that contained like uh, placeholders, mixins, variables, etc. And at the time, yes, SAS was probably one of the more popular styling frameworks. Um, uh, there was a few others, like there was uh, less. We, we could have also used um, like CSS modules or post CSS, but um, yes, yeah, SAS was very popular at the time. CSS and JS in general wasn't really um, mainstream at that point. So this is a very high level diagram of, um, I guess, how we use SAS. So we have a component which has uh, SAS, JS, and static files, so static files being like images or PDFs or whatever. Um, we, from, from that component, we'll import the um, if you're very um, uh, re reusable uh, library, which had common SAS, mixins, placeholders, variables, etc. 
We also had an internal build tool. Um, and basically, that, yeah, that build tool internally used Node SAS and uh, you know, spat out CSS files, JS files, and static pieces. Um, this isn't entirely accurate as the point of 2016. Um, we actually had uh, two different build, build tools, one on the component, one on the server, but uh, I wanted to keep this a bit um, simple. So. so yeah, this is um, how it looks inside the actual component. So I guess there's a directory structure, you've got your SAS folder, um, and then inside of that you've got a main entry point, which is your styles.scss. Um, in that file, in that, in that main entry point, we import every very, uh, import every very. Uh, we also import any other libraries that we're using within that component. So if you code loader, for instance, is a dependency. And then, and then we have like our main select um, SAS, which which contains you know various various things like um, uh, placeholders, mixins, variables, etc. You'll notice that we're also using web na uh, namespacing for for naming. Yeah, fast forward to uh, 2017, January. Uh, Jess Tilford created a Slack channel. Uh, no SAS. <coughs> uh, basically, uh, from my understanding, it was to discuss um, ways to get off SAS, uh, move, moving our architecture away from SAS. So it was like, constructive um, talks on, on that. So as soon as that channel was started, uh, various suggestions came up by the various engineers um, suggesting alternatives to SAS. Um, but we needed to step back and think about why. Um, like, were we moving away? Did we want to move away from SAS because it was, it was succumbing to tech hype? Um, the SASE CSS syntax wasn't really a pain point. Most of us kind of liked writing in that syntax. They were just used to it. They got the job done. So what were the main point, uh, pain points from moving away from SAS? I guess the, probably the major point was um, having multiple versions of the same component caused style crashes. So with our architecture, we could actually have two different versions of Epico Select within our page component. And what that did, I'm not sure what that's covering there, but um, what that did was um, cause problems on the page, like styling problems on the page. Ideally, you 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 would also only have one ver one one major on the on the page, but it wasn't always uh, feasible uh, due to time constraints or whatnot. You have to rework um, an entire page component sometimes to do that. So um, this was like probably the main annoyance with us. Um, the BEM syntax was also very annoying, so um, it required a lot of developer brain power to think of all these different names. As a developer, you, you don't really want to have to think about that sort of stuff. Um, the actual CSS is very bloated. Um, there's lots of kind of nested selector, uh, um, nested selector overload. There's a lot of unused CSS on the page, etc. Uh, we also needed uh, critical CSS. That, that's um, one thing that was, always came up in performance audits was the fact that we um, we only want to um, uh, render the styles that are above the fold. So any so any other styles would kind of be on the bottom of the document. Um, there was also a few other issues, like uh, SAS compilation was very slow due to a few factors, theming, static assets, etc. Um, and then node SAS binary is actually very problematic with um, um, developers that wanted to use Windows. So um, it always come up with like kind of compilation errors and things like that. So um, we wanted to remedy that. So with the many components architecture, it meant that we needed to be careful about what we chose. We wanted to ensure our components were consistent um, across different code bases. So, developer jumping from one, one repo to the next should be consistent. Sh shouldn't have to be a completely different framework or whatever. Performance was critical. 
Uh, we didn't want any slowdown with any change that we made. Uh, we also didn't want to rework in in the short term. Like I know, you know, we, we eventually have to rework at some point, um, whatever framework we, we need. But like ideally, we'd want to stick with something for the long term. And we needed a great dev experience. Developers shouldn't. Um, should enjoy uh, styling React components. It shouldn't be a chore. So, so we all agreed that we needed to experiment <coughs> and figure out which framework to use. Um, so anyone, anyone was free to experiment. Any developer was free to experiment. And this was kind of done outside of regular product work, as I, as I mentioned before. So yeah, here's a here's a PR a PR that was thrown up by Brett. Uh, who works here at Domain. Um, he, he tried out style components with the component uh, that we have. And yeah, this is uh, probably the most popular CSS and JS framework. Um, so as, as the name suggests, it's basically a, write, a way to write styles as components. Uh, it uses JS template literals where you chuck in CSS, as you can see there. Um, and you have the ability to pass in props. Yeah, that's kind of how it works. So we kind of went through the pros and cons of each, um, each of the things that we kind of investigated. But yeah, with style components, um, I guess the I guess the pro was uh, was very popular. Um, it's kind of a good thing because. Again, you don't have to go and rework something. Um, if, it, if it's less popular, it doesn't get maintained. That's not a good thing, right? So um, the, the cool thing about style components is it's, it's a bit easier to delete unused styles because they're all tied, tied to components. It has pretty good cons as well. I guess the, the cons for us were it was pretty difficult for us to migrate to. Um, a code mod would be pretty impossible, let's say. Um, Bundle size also at the time wasn't that great. And a lot of people kind of didn't like the fact that um, your JSX would no longer be semantic. So as an example here, so we've got, if we just look at the JSX, you can see, I don't know, if, can everyone see that? Yep. If you look at the JSX here, um, looking at that doesn't really, you don't really know what container is. Context switching, you look, you look at container and you're like, oh, you're going to have to go to the container style. You look at container style.div. Oh, it's a div. Um, ideally, we didn't want that. We just wanted to see divs, basically, or sections or inputs or whatever. So. <coughs> and yeah, architecting uh, style components projects is a challenge. So it would be more, more or less a rewrite of each of our components. And we kind of wanted to avoid that, seeing as though we had so many different uh, components. So Greg uh, tried out Glamorous as well. So it's, it's similar to style components, except instead of writing CSS using JS template, template literals, it was done through object properties. Um, the added advantage here was you could also extract CSS into a file as well with this library. I'm not sure if that's the case with the style components these days, but um, that's what it was at this point in time. So you, you kind of had two options um, with Glamorous. You could, you could um, uh, get, get a div out of Glamorous and just use a div and just put in, put in a bunch of props. Or you could um, do it like style components, style like that, except using objects. <coughs> so yeah, with style components, pretty much the same sort of cons, except um, it also had extraction of CSS. Um, a con though was again difficult for us to migrate migrate to. I guess the biggest reason we didn't go with Glamorous was um, uh, the author Kenzie Dodds started to hint that um, he preferred emotion. Um, so, so basically, um, it was eventually deprecated. Um, and for us, it was almost dead on arrival, because by the time we started experimenting with it, he was talking about how he wanted to move to emotion. So. Um, 
we also talked about style of JSX. Um, there wasn't actually a block for this one, but um, we kind of just talked about it. So um, it's basically you put in a, a style uh, style tag in your JSX, and it gets um, transpiled to something like this. So everything's namespaced. So this is uh, this is a bit like a, a shadow DOM style encapsulation, which uh, closely resembles uh, web components. Advantages <coughs> uh, also work. Small and fast, and it's uh, it's future proof because it's um, equivalent to the um, server render renderable shadow CSS. Uh, the cons, are, I think, a lot of a lot of developers didn't like the fact that they had to put a style um, tag within their JSX. They just thought it was a bit weird. Um, um, I think that's main basically the main reason we probably didn't actually do this one. But um, uh, the other reason was it wasn't really mature at the time. Um, it was used by Next, the Next.js team, so it's, it's part of Next.js. Um, and it was, wasn't really that popular outside of Next.js. Next um, one other option that we tried, uh, that we thought would spike, was adding some <coughs> CSS plugins and CSS modules. Um, so the idea here was that we keep most of the existing, the existing SAS syntax. Um, while this wasn't CSS and JS, we thought it would satisfy some quick pain points we had with our current SAS setup. Um, so we could we could get rid of the problematic problematic node um, node SAS binary, and we could also remove the need for using BEM namespacing. Um, with this approach, we could also use um, we could have also used CSS Next, which was which is now deprecated, um, but it would have allowed us to use future CSS syntax now. Um, think of it as um, the babel for CSS, basically. <coughs> so we did actually get this working um, with minimal changes to SAS in a component, but we quickly found out that this wasn't really um, worth doing as a staged approach um, because performance ended up being slower than what it was using Node SAS. Um, because of the sheer amount of post-CSS plugins we needed to get this going, it actually slowed down the pipeline quite a bit. Um, we also because we basically use every single feature of SAS, um, we kind of needed needed a lot of post CSS plugins for this to work. Uh, some SAS syntax couldn't even be supported as well. So, um, <coughs> so for example, like functions and if, if statements. Um, I mean, we could have got, gotten rid of those, but it probably wasn't worth the hassle. Um, there's also some nasty side effects. So whenever you do like math in uh, in SAS, um, the math evaluation was different when we were using post CSS plugins. So um, it was, we just basically scrapped this idea. So to give you an idea, this is the amount of uh, post CSS plugins we had to use uh, to get to get it working. But um, yeah, that kind of explained the performance drop. So, so next we tried a motion. Uh, there was a few few people that suggested this um, prior to me throwing up this PR, um, but um, yeah, it's, it sounded like a pretty good candidate. So I figured we'd try it out with um, the carousel. Like there was a carousel component we've got, so converted that one. So it looked a little bit like this um, in a separate file, um, just like we've got separate. Uh, SAS files, um, we can have a separate um, style file, style that, so whatever.style.js, and then have various uh, CSS, CSS functions in here. So as you can see, the syntax is, is actually pretty similar to our existing SAS setup. Um, yeah, and so from a component, we intended it on um, importing these styles from uh, just like this, basically. So import um, style.js file, and then just pass it in as a CSS prop. So behind the scenes, the motion converts that CSS to a class name, and um, and it hashes the actual class name as well for you. So it's all um, it's all unique 
it's a content hash, basically, it's, it's, gonna, it's gonna always be unique. So yeah, we went through the pros and cons of emotion. So um, it's a popular CSS and JS framework. From my understanding, I think it's um, uh, maybe the, the second most popular at the moment. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, had excellent performance, it still does. Uh, we don't need to clutter our JSX with style components, so we can just use um, just just import um, CSS from a separate file and just pass it into the CSS prop. The, the easiest migration path um, is probably in motion because we can potentially automate some of this as well. So we can automate um, uh, converting our, our SAS files to Emotion JS files. Uh, it supports things like uh, uh, composition, nested selectors, and global styles as well, which we all need. Uh, support support server-side rendering, and it plays nice with our legacy SAS components. Um, probably the, the cons at the time, um, well, the, the docs probably weren't as nice as something like style components, but um, I think that's kind of improving at the moment, so. Um, so we discussed this, this spike at length in our front-end guild meetings. So we have guild meetings like kind of usually every week. Um, and yeah, we went through this one and we, we agreed this was the way forward, um, especially after we spiked pretty much everything else. Um, and we kind of need, needed to make a decision because um, uh, we, we didn't want to be stuck with that basically forever. So, so how was emotion implemented across the main group? Was you know, how that is the question? Like how, how do we actually implement this across the board, uh, not just one component? So uh, when we agreed to use emotion, we also agreed at least for now to not use the style components. Um, <coughs> Uh, format with emotion. So, with emotion, you can actually um, create style components just like the style components library itself. Um, but we thought it's probably going to be an easier migration path if we just stick with CSS um, string styles for now. Um, as I mentioned before, like, it's less brain power. We don't have to worry about um, you know looking at JSX and figuring out which um, uh, how semantic it is, etc. Um, so for the, for the time being, basically, we have disabled um, the emotion style import with an ES lint rule. Uh, it's a bit of a heated topic, but um, we may bring it back in the future. But yeah, the main reason is basically the migration path. It's going to be easier. So this is the ES lint rule. Uh, what, one of the initial things we have to do with emotion was to modify, modify our internal tooling. So if you build, uh, we had to modify it to get server-side rendering working. Um, so that was with Emotion 9. Uh, with, with Emotion 10, server-side rendering just works out of the box uh, with some caveats that just, just told me about before. But um, uh, We also had to make um, a Emotion Core a PDAP. Um, because of our many um, many repo set up. Um, basically there's a chance that we would have like two different versions of emotion in the component tree. And that will, that's what we wanted to kind of avoid. Um, so yeah, just having a peer, de peer dependency um, kind of solved that issue. And so it also makes it a little bit more painful to update, um, upgrade emotion. But it's, yeah, with our, with our current architecture, it is pretty painful to update React and React DOM as well. So, um, but like hopefully we don't have to update them very often. Um, one of the first things we need to do was ensure that all uh, all of our themes, margins, paddings, layers, sizes, etc., from FEBRARY were exported as uh, just plain JavaScript objects. Um, and this was actually done like long before we even chose Emotion. Um, so yeah, this was one requirement that we needed. This is just one example, but. Um, We needed this basically so we can import um, this into our emotion files and, um, and, and use these variables. Um, emotion does have theming support. Um, so <coughs> you've got this theme provider thing and, um, and basically then you can then pass theme everywhere and um, uh, 
within your CSS function uh, access theme. It's not really ideal though, um, so uh, we need to pass theme basically everywhere. It would have been a bit of a nightmare to do that, so um, we kind of made it a bit more seamless. So we, we decided to make it, uh, we decided to roll our own and um, do it based on an, an, essentially an environment variable on startup of the application. So, um, so what it means is it's, it's really themeless. Um, Seamless, not <laughs> um, so, so basically when you import every very variables um, and you've started the server with a uh, like a domain theme, uh, variables.color.neutral200, for example, is going to be a domain neutral200. Neutral if for whatever reason we started the server with um, a CRE theme, it will automatically pick the CRE neutral200. So, um, so it's a bit of magic behind the scenes, just using the, um, the, the pack defined plugin. Uh, we just thought this was a little bit easier, so you don't have to go and pass the theme everywhere. Uh, we also needed to update our, our styled utility functions. So um, we needed like emotion helpers that we um, we needed to import it into each of our components. And so um, we converted, for example, this uh, placeholder a tag thing to, to this emotion one, which is basically looks very similar. And there's probably about 20, 30 other kind of utility functions that we had to convert, which didn't take too long. Um, because we have a lot of components and there's no way of updating each component to emotion at a, in a reasonable time frame, uh, we needed to ensure that there was backwards compatibility. Um, we still need needed to support the style um, SCSS um, entry point for adding styles and components that have yet to be converted to a motion. So, so currently we still use Node SAS behind the scenes. So um, the component still has the ability to have entry points in uh, uh, has this entry point. Eventually we're going to remove this, but um, uh, yeah, when we do do actually make that change, it's going to be a major change to our tool. Um, we use uh, uh, Selenium testing, Selenium end-to-end -end testing in our code bases. Uh, we previously targeted class name, so that's obviously no longer possible because these class names are um, not deterministic. So um, we could no longer use class names, and we, we started to use data test attribute, data test ID attribute. Um, we don't use this on the every, every every single circumstance, but. Um, yeah, you can see the example there, so we can target that. Uh, we also needed to um, lint our styles. Uh, we currently use style lint config style components uh, at the moment, which is the same as the style components library. Um, which it's, the same, it's the same syntax, pretty much the same syntax, so we can use this, the same uh, style lint config. Uh, we also found it was a bit nicer to co-locate the styles, so um, any reusable styles will still be in a base style directory, but um, uh, if it was just styles that are related to that, that component in, that in particular, it would just be in the same folder. Um, there's some scenarios where, where it actually may be more beneficial to inline the styles, um, but we still haven't figured out how to actually link the styles with that approach. Um, I haven't really looked into it um, for, for, for that much, so yeah, maybe there's an easy way to do that. Uh, we also created a migration tool, so Albert, who's done a talk here before, um, worked mostly on this one. So um, it's basically a CLI command. Um, it'll parse your um, SAS files into, pro into a post-CSS AST and, um, and generate an emotion.js file as output. Um, it kind of gets us maybe 75, 50, uh, 75, 80% of the way. Um, for everything else, it kind of gives you warnings as to what you, you have to like basically man manually intervene and fix these things. Um, you probably can't see that GIF, but it's okay. Uh, we, we, as part of the onboarding process for our engineers, we also ran some emotion workshops to help devs um, know how to convert their, um, their SAS components to emotion. 
Um, and yeah, here's some of the engineers that were involved here. So, so yeah, some, some, big, some big wins include, um, there's, there's obviously no more star flashing. Um, Motion class names are uh, content, uh, based on a content hash and are always unique. There's no more annoying node SAS. Um, we can actually uh, support Windows um, developers now, so... Uh, devs don't actually care about um, naming classes now, so it's faster to style stuff. And we've also noticed some, some nice performance gains as well, uh, mostly due to less CSS bloat. So yeah, there's, there's some common questions from some of the developers. So one common question was, how can I target elements in Markup? Um, with Emotion, there's also a Babel plugin, Emotion plugin. So um, with that, you can uh, you can automatically add labels to um, your your class names. So and it's all based on like. You can set it up so that it's based on your, your the variable name that you've set. So, for example, if you have a variable called Martin, uh, it'll add this um, uh, prefix, uh, sorry, suffix Martin at the end of the, um, the class name. Uh, another, there's a lot of questions about composing styles together. Um, so, with the motion way of doing things, um, the recommended approach is to um, uh, use the CSS prop and um, accept a, a, an array of styles. So your rightmost style would have precedence over everything else. Um, the great thing about this is um, it doesn't matter where you declare your CSS, unlike uh, SAS, uh, SAS order matters. Um, whereas, you know, I can have my constant base above danger or below danger, it doesn't really matter. It's all about where I've actually used it. So there's less chance of actually um, adding hacks like um, uh, the, the important hacks or it just makes better use of the CSS cascade in this case. So yeah, in this example, um, uh, the base was used last, so the color is going to be turquoise. Uh, we did run into some issues of emotion which are worth mentioning. Um, so, Emotion 10 has a CSS prop, and the, the Babel plugin that comes with, uh, comes with it transpiles the CSS prop to this forward ref format. Um, so, basically, it transpiles this H1 to this forward ref format. And what that meant was um, when we're using, like, so, so we actually use Mocha and um, uh, Enzyme for our tests, for our unit tests. and um, Whenever we're trying to find H1, that wouldn't actually work in this case because the H1 doesn't even exist now. So, kind of a workaround was we had to disable the Babel plugin, um, which isn't ideal because it means like when you when you've got a mounted test, um, you can't actually check the actual markup that was was rendered. So it, it's yeah, basically not ideal. Um, there was another annoyance was basically um, whatever you got like a third party component you're using which accepts a property, uh, accepts a prop which isn't necessarily just a class name. So if, for example in this, in this slider prop, uh, slider component sorry, it accepts this dots class uh, prop and for, for us to actually pass that in with emotion 10, it's really convoluted, you need to, you need to wrap um, uh, essentially everything in this class names um, container to get access to this CSS thing to then generate a class name. So um, it doesn't happen very often, but like yeah, you probably might have to run, you could run into something like this. Um, um, and it, yeah, I was a bit surprised that critical CSS, um, well, I, don't, I don't think it's really supported um, like, so anything above the fold, you you think you know goes above uh, goes above the, the current markup, but then anything below uh, all the style tags would probably be just before the end of the bottom tag. 
but that's not actually the case. What we've found is um, all the style tags get pushed into the head. Um, so it's not like kind of true um, critical CSS, but um, I think Jess has mentioned that there's ways around this. So, so yeah, right on note, I'd like to thank all, all of the main engineers that are involved. It was a great team effort. Um, it, was a, it was a very long and lengthy process, um, but I think sometimes it pays off. Um, so hopefully others may gain from this talk and, and gain insight into how, how large uh, code change like this can be done at scale. Thank you. Do you have any questions? We do. Yeah, so last issue is not an issue when you're going to sales at Red Ink with promotion. It actually interleaves your HTML with style text, but after JavaScript is running, Emotion finds all the style text and moves them to the hidden. So from a server response, that's correct as you want to have. But later, it's everything in the hidden. So that's another bug in its feature. Yeah, I think just just mentioned that to me just prior to the talk. There, there is one caveat that it's, it's correct. The style tags are interleaved into the DOM elements. If you use a first child selector, because there's a style tag there where it used to be a DOM element, your first child will target the style selector, uh, sorry, the style element, and not the, the DOM element. Uh, which means if you're trying to apply margin top to the first child, it won't be there until after the client side JS is run. And that style tag is moved into the head. Now suddenly the first child is the DOM element, which means you have things jumping around on the page. I ran into that bug. It's annoying. Um, but it's, a, it's not a bug. It is a feature of Emotion. There is a way around it, though. Um, Emotion has a server-side renderer for extracting them before it sends the HTML to the browser. just requires a little bit of extra setup. Um, but there's not really a solution to that other than using a, a like headless browser to render it and then move the things around as far as I know. Any other questions? First of all, thank you very much. And just uh, ask for a best practice suggestion for the end-to-end -end testing. In your slide, there is a extra data attribute for the emotion, right? Would you suggest to do an extra phase after the end-to-end -end test, use Babel or something to remove that tag? To, improve, uh, to reduce the file size? Yeah, you, you could, you could uh, do something like that. But um, I guess the problem with that at our end is um, we actually run our end to end tests with no data production. So um, it's probably ways to do it. But um, yes, you could potentially remove those attributes with a bell plugin, yes. Okay. Cool. Um, Thanks. Probably removes, removes a bit of bloat. But like, we don't, I mean, we don't, we don't uh, for every single element, we don't go and add a uh, data test ID attribute. Um, that'll be just awful, but um, we kind of only do it when we need it, basically. Yep, thanks. Um, there's a Ken C. Dodds article on this. Um, read that. It's really good. Yep. Can you post that article uh, yeah, after this? <laughs> If it does become a problem in the future, like we, we can always convert to the style components format. Um, I guess um, Emotion supports it, and then we can also eventually move this, like, the actual style components library itself, because it's, it's probably actually more maintained, or it's more popular, I guess. <laughs> no, it's really not. <laughs> um, but like, it, yeah, if it becomes a problem, we can always convert. Um, yeah, but. I guess the reason why we choose chose the string style, the, the CSS string styles format, is because it's an, it's an easier migration path. Um, uh, have you have you run through any issues when when it comes to I don't know like deeply nested components or lots of uh, pseudo classes or those like really 
like really use weird uh, child classes or other like, weird cases? Have you ever run into any issues? Um, I haven't personally, but I think maybe Matt has. I don't know if, you, if you've got any um, kind of examples of that. No? No, well, we, we converted a lot through the code mod. Right. So I'm sure the, like a lot of the stuff that the code mod spat out looks pretty ugly. Yeah, it works, and it's great. Yeah. But when we write like just ourselves, you know, new components, then you just compose them probably in a different way than you might write in SAS. And taking all those conversion and helper functions into account, the performance still better. Uh, I'll let throw back to Mark for that one. Uh, performance, we, we didn't no notice any de degradation. Um, we do have some audits which, which I didn't actually share here, but it um, seems, seems to be performance has actually improved because there's less um, CSS on the page itself. So with our SAS um, architecture, like on a given page, we probably only use like maybe 40, 40 percent of the, the actual CSS that was on the page, which is really bad. So, yeah. Any more questions? I do have a quick one. Um, uh, <laughs> Have you had any experience with React Native, um, Emotion React Native? Like I know style components couple very well with it. Um, um, I did some React Native maybe two years ago, but yeah, I haven't touched it since. So, um, Jed Watson. <laughs> Emotion also supports the uh, React Native, but from the author, don't use it. Just use the built-in um, React Native style sheets. It's what you want. Yeah, okay. Yep. Right. We've had this discussion like in our office with the emotion maintainer. He says don't use it. Um, <laughs> and don't use style components version either, just use random <laughs> star shape. Big round of applause for <laughs>